If there's one thing that I've learned on this journey for Christ, it is this, that the hearts and minds of men are exceedingly deceitful. One minute, you're a criminal, and the next, a king. <laughs> but there is only one king, and I serve him. After the shipwreck, everybody on board made it safely to land, all 276 of us. And as we arrived, the people from the island of Malta were very kind and gracious, and they built a large fire so that we could warm ourselves and dry our clothes. In my effort to help them, I began carrying bundles of sticks. But as I drew close to the flame, a viper, a poisonous snake, came out, driven by the heat, and fixed itself to my arm. It was at that point that the people from the island decided that I must be a, a murderer or notorious criminal. But there was work to do, so as I went about my duties, they saw that there was no swelling and that I did not die. <laughs> And so they then declared me to be a god. But as we all know, there is only one god, and we serve him. Near to the beach, there was a, a very large house, and it belonged to the governor of the island. His name was Publius, and out of his kindness, he allowed us to stay there at his home for three days. As I arrived, I learned that his father was very sick, suffering with a high fever and dysentery. So I asked if I could simply pray for him, and he allowed me to go in. And as I laid my hands upon him, the power of Christ healed him. Well, suddenly the news spread throughout the island, and many people began to come from all over the place. And the power of God healed every one of them. Give thanks to the Creator. <laughs> well, they wanted to give us gifts, so they began bringing gifts from all over, and soon we had all that we needed. In fact, they brought so much that they even provided for everything we needed for the voyage to come. So you see, my friends, even through the most difficult of times, the Lord will provide. And so now, our journey continues. Well, thus far, Paul's journey has been anything but smooth sailing. If it could go wrong, it seems like it goes wrong. For two solid weeks, They've been out in a storm, a massive storm that was crossing the entire region of the Mediterranean. As you have read through the account, you realize they were unable to steer the ship, and the ship was totally now at the mercy of the angry sea. One by one, the structural components of the ship began to fail, and ultimately the ship itself broke apart. Of the 276 persons on board, 275 of them considered making it to shore safely an impossibility. However, there was one person on board with a promise from God. And in the midst of this storm, Paul, the only one with a promise, clung to the promise like it was a life ring. The promise was twofold. First of all, that he would testify in Rome as he had in Jerusalem. The Lord himself had spoken to him, you know, and told him, just as you have given testimony of me in Jerusalem, you must do so in Rome, so to Rome you will go. And the second part of the promise was, the ship one day will be destroyed, but there will be no loss of life. Friends, when God gives you a promise, no matter how the storms may rage and how furious the storm may be, I encourage you this morning, hold fast to the promise of God. When God gives you a promise, it's a promise you can absolutely 
counts on. It will never be failed. In Numbers 23 and verse 19, it says this, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Notice there, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Whatever he says, he will do. Friends, when all you have is a promise from God, regardless how dire the situation may be that you find yourself in in that moment, that promise from God will always be more than enough. No matter what the situation, God's promise will always be more than enough. And so clinging to that promise from God and a broken shard of the ship, Paul, along with all on board, made it safely to the shore of a tiny island that is found south of Sicily called Malta. When they arrived on the shore, I can only imagine what a mess they must have been. Two weeks in the midst of a storm. They have been exhausted. They're in the waters that were cold. It was winter time, hypothermic. They're sick from ingesting salt water. And I can only imagine what they must have looked like. There's a missionary by the name of Charles Greenaway that would always say, you're going to make it. You're not going to look like much, but you're going to make it. And I think that's probably the way Paul felt that day. I've made it, but barely. And there he is on the shoreline. Let's pick it up now in Acts 28, starting with verse 1. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. You can look on any map today, and you'll find where Malta's at. It's about 60 miles south of Sicily. It's a very small island. It has only about 95 square miles total in the entire uh, island. Yet, listen what it says. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. He says it was unusual the way they greeted us. It was unusual the way they showed kindness to us. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. So not only did they just get off a ship that had broken to pieces after two weeks of being bounced around in a storm, here it is, it's raining and it's cold. Now in the midst of the trials of life, you know, you'll find that oft times God has placed in your path someone of great compassion. You're driving down the highway and suddenly your car boils over or you blow a tire or something else happens. And along will come what we call a good Samaritan, someone that is caring, somebody that is concerned, and they will stop and they will help you. How often in the midst of the trials of life, if you're cognizant and looking for it, you will see God has strategically sent someone to minister to you in that time of need. It may be somebody you know, it may be somebody that you've never met before. Many times over the years, whenever I've had a car that, you know, chose to break down on the highway, especially on the long travels back and forth between here and South Dakota, I would find someone would come by and they'd always be half drunk. And yet, it was as though they were sent. And we had great opportunities to minister to them, and they helped me. And it was always amazing how God saw to it that in the hard and difficult times of life, someone was there. And I would assure you this morning that God has done the same thing for you time and time again. And that is what he did for Paul. You see, God is never caught off guard. God knows what's happening. God knows what's going to happen. And there he strategically places men and women in places at a strategic time in our life to be the voice of God and compassion when we need it. So when he landed on this island, this island could have been a very hostile place. It could have been filled with flesh-eating cannibals, but it was not. Paul says they showed us unusual kindness. And so they built a fire because it was raining and it was cold, and they were, I'm sure, at the very edge of hypothermic. And they welcomed them. 
which implies not only were they on the shore saying, hey, it's great to have you guys on our island. They were meeting their physical needs. When it says welcome here, it's in a temporal way. They were meeting the temporal needs. I'm sure they were bringing blankets, and they were bringing clothing, and they were starting this fire to warm them so that they might have what they have you know, need of just to sustain life in that cold and dismal setting. Look at verse 3. So Paul sees them, you know, starting this fire, and he's going to pitch in and help. Look at it in verse 3. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. Now you think about a bad day. I mean, this guy, he cannot win for loss. Here he is, two weeks out on the sea, I'm sure that most everyone on board is seasick, and possibly Paul as well. And uh, the ship breaks up. They grab a hold of whatever is floating and try to make their way to shore. They're cold and every other imaginable thing. And now, as he's warming around the fire and seeing that the fire is now beginning to wane and go down, you know, and uh, realizing it needs more wood, he goes out and he finds some wood. Now, here's what's interesting about Paul. You'll find Paul always pitching into help. No matter what the situation is that you read about in Scripture, if Paul can do something about it, Paul is willing to do so. I couldn't help but uh, think of a great aunt of mine. It was my mother's aunt. That she would come and visit my mother as her aunt once a year. And when she would arrive, she had always come very early, coming from Minnesota to our home in South Dakota. She had always come very early in the morning expecting breakfast. And so here she would come, and you have to imagine now, my mother has 11 children, and she has all this responsibility. And uh, when guests would come, you know, it was just kind of an added load to her day. But this aunt would come, and she would slide her chair up to the table. Fork in one hand, knife in the other. I'm waiting for breakfast. And so my mother would serve breakfast and breakfast and vacation. You know, they were on kind of a vacation schedule, and so they had nothing pressing, but mom had to get kids off to school and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and then she would just back her chair up to the wall. After she'd eaten breakfast, she would just slide it back to the wall. Then when it was time for lunch, she would take and scoot it back up. And there she would be. And then they would have lunch and then back off again by the wall. Never get out of that chair other than go to the restroom. And uh, my mother one day just kind of looked and said to us kids, I sure wish she would help a little bit when she comes. Well, Paul was not the sort that was going to slide his chair up to the table for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He was one that if he saw a need, he pitched in and he got with it. And I think that's the way we ought to be living our lives as well. When we see a need, if we can do something about it, I think we ought to do that. You know, it's done in such simple ways. We get so ingrained and so caught up in our own lives that we walk right by simple opportunities that I believe that God would give to us that we can make a difference in someone's life. You know, even for some of these young moms, you know, and I watch these young moms as they come and go. They'll have one child holding them by the hand. They'll have a diaper bag over the shoulder. They're pushing another one in the stroller, and they're trying to maneuver through doors and getting car doors open and all this kind of stuff. And just a simple holding a door for a young mother like that can be a great blessing to them. Paul was always watching. And so it was on this particular day. They have this fire now that's going on the beach, and he sees if he doesn't do something, if somebody doesn't do something, the fire is soon to go out. And so he does the thing that he always does best. He pitches in to help. So he places the wood that he had gathered on the fire, and this viper lunged out of the wood and sunk its fangs into his hand. And the Bible says it literally was hanging from his hand. Now, the term viper is an interesting term when you read about it in the Bible. The term viper, when you read about it in Scripture, always refers to a venomous snake. 
It's not a harmless one. It's always, every single time, it is a venomous snake. Now, if you were to go oh, and, uh, and look up Malta and try to find out what kind of a snake it was, uh, you probably will find that they'll say it was something like a king snake or something of that nature. However, during that time, poisonous snakes were very prominent on the island of Malta. As the years have gone by and as that small little island has now been overrun by population, many of these poisonous snakes have been killed over the years and so they would tell us today there is none. However, at that time, they identified, they knew, they had seen this kind of a viper, this kind of a snake bite others and they would swell up or just drop dead, one of the two. And so as he places this wood upon the fire, as the warmth begins to, you know, penetrate these, these new logs and, and the brush that he put on, suddenly this snake lurches out and latches onto him. You know, some days, uh, life is just rather unexplainable, isn't it? You know, sometimes you're trying to figure out why did this happen? Why, of all the days, of all the things that could happen, why did this go wrong? And if it could go wrong, it seems like it is going wrong for Paul. Now look at verse 4. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer. For though he escaped the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. They were very superstitious. And so they believed that though he had escaped, you know, the, the waters and the storm, he is now being judged by this goddess justice because they believe all of these were gods or goddesses. But in verse 5 it says, But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said, he is a what? He is a God. You know, people can be very fickle. At one moment, he is a villain. Now they're venerating him. Look at verse 5. It says, and Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. You know, the term that is used here for shook off is a very rare word, and it's only found two times in the Bible. Only twice in the Bible you find anything shook off. This is one of them, where he shook off the snake, and the other is found in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus told his disciples, if they do not receive you, if people do not welcome you, leave the town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. The only two times in the Bible where it talks about shaking off. First time is Paul shaking off the snake here, and then the other you'll find in the Gospels in Luke chapter 9, verse 5, when Jesus said, if you go into a village, go into a community, and they reject me and they reject you, go to the outskirts of the city and shake off the dust of your sandals and move on. To shake off is a very decisive action. It's not something that's just, you know, slight. It is a very definitive shaking off. It is flinging away. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate snakes. When you had the options up on the board, how many chose snake? Yeah. How many chose? What did you choose? Tell me. The scorpion. I think all of us have, you know, something that we hate. Well, my wife and I, we, we have no time for snakes, and especially my wife, Sherry. We were visiting uh, the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and uh, Sherry and I were on a path leading to the gravesite of George Beverly Shea. Anybody remember that name, George Beverly Shea? He traveled with Billy Graham for decades. He was a soloist, and literally, he blessed people around the world. He passed away, and he is buried there at the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so we heard that his grave was there, and so I said to Sherry, I said, let's go over and look at the gravesite 
um, of uh, George Beverly Shea. And so we're on this small little footpath and we're making our way and just ahead of us about six or eight feet, Sherry looked down and there was about an eight foot black snake slithering across our path. Now she let out a scream that is so loud that is still echoing in the valleys of North Carolina. <laughs> if you were to go there today and just be quiet for a moment, you'll hear this blood curdling scream. And so <laughs> people came running. I mean, they were wondering what is going on over there. And they came over there and they said, what's wrong? And Sherry could not even yet speak. She was absolutely hyperventilating from what she had just encountered and the screams she just let out. And I told them, well, my wife Sherry just met George Beverly Shea almost in heaven. And uh, I mean, she almost died. And from that moment on, wherever we would go, all throughout that area over to Ashland and others, um, her eyes were always scanning. She could not enjoy much of any of that outdoor stuff because she was always looking for snakes. Think about Paul. His contrary winds, which blows the ship off from its original path. There's a storm, a storm that doesn't go away, a shipwreck, a snake bite. Friends, I believe that all of these were Satan's attempt to stop Paul's global mission. You see, God was sending him on a mission. He said, you will go just as you have testified of me here in Jerusalem. You will do the same in Rome. And the devil knew that Rome was the center of the world's government and population at that time. And if the gospel would go to Rome, it would all go from Rome around the world. And so the enemy puts everything out there that he can, whether it's a shipwreck, the snake bite, all of this, it's all part of Satan trying to stop the plan of God. Friend, I would tell you this morning that when the enemy is fighting every move and things are going badly in your life, it's very possible that Satan considers you a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And I tell you this morning, shake it off. Shake it off. When the viper bites with jealousy, as it did with Saul, Saul came back from battle, you know the story, and he heard the women singing in the streets that Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And the Bible says so clearly, at that moment, jealousy overtook him. He could not stand the fact women were saying that David had killed more than what he had and that he was a greater warrior in their eyes. And so he became jealous. Friends, the longer you wait to shake something off, the more the venom will kill you and destroy you from the inside. And so it was. The viper bites with jealousy. And when he does, shake it off. He bites with resentment. Shake it off. He brings bitterness. Shake it off. He causes anger. Shake it off. Hatred, sadness, regrets. You look at your life and he tries to tell you, you would have, should have, could have, might have. You failed and you have a thousand regrets. And these regrets become so overwhelming in your life that you can't even get up and face a new day. Depression sets in and discouragement. I'm here to tell you this morning, like that snake, you need to shake it off. If you're facing an addiction this morning, let me encourage you, shake it off. I was listening to the news last evening, and within five hours in Milwaukee yesterday, five deaths related to drugs. This past week, three have died that I personally have known from drug overdose. The enemy is out to rob, kill, and destroy. Friends, you need to shake it off. 
And if this morning you need help, we're here to help you. You saw the care groups that are upcoming. And these care groups deal with overcoming addictions. They speak about overcoming financial problems in your life. Wherever the enemy has come, we have determined that we want to stand alongside of you and we want to help you to shake it off. I serve on the national board of Teen Challenge USA. And the reason why I give my time and my energy to be part of this ministry is because I see the Jesus factor making the difference in the lives of men and women that have been addicted to drugs of every kind and he will set you free. Shake it off. Let us stand alongside of you. Let us help you shake it off. When critical words come, and they will literally, they will bite like a viper. And when that venom of criticism gets into your bloodstream, it will cause the death of your dreams and your godly aspirations. Let me tell you, shake it off. And when people attempt to define you as being stupid, or as a loser, shake it off. Friend, the only one that has the right to define who you are is Jesus Christ. And he is the one that says, you are my son, you are my daughter. I love you and I've got big plans for your life. Shake it off. I want you to picture for a moment a room filled with people, all with vipers hanging from them. And the vipers are are pumping their venom into their bloodstream. And the longer you wait to get rid of it, the more poison in your system, the more devastation it causes. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Father, this morning, I believe there's men and women in all this room that are ready to shake it off. They're saying there's words that have been said that have really had a very negative effect upon my life. How I view myself, I see it in light of the criticism that I've had that I can't do anything right, I'll never amount to anything. Father, I pray that we'll shake it off. Lord, for those that Criticism is just overwhelming. And it seems to come from the people that they should be able to trust the most. But I pray today they would shake it off. Lord, they would not allow the venom to pump into their body any longer. They would shake it off. Lord, things that have happened in the past, horrible things, devastating things, things that should never happen. Help them to shake it off. Lord, we're so glad we don't have to live with all of this venom in our system any longer, but that you are here in this house to set the captive free, to give them a brand new start. And I pray, Lord, these next few moments men and women, boys and girls, people of every age, they will say, enough is enough. I'm shaking it off this morning. And I need God's help, but he has promised he'll help me. And I will shake this thing. It will no longer hold me back. It will no longer be the venom in my system. This morning, I've made up my mind. No more, no more, no more. I'm shaking it off. If that's you this morning. You'd say, you know, Pastor, there's some things that I want to be rid of. Some things that have happened in my life that just keep on following me, and I'm tired of it. I want to shake it off. Let me see your hands real high all over this room. Yeah. I'm going to ask you, every person in the house, just raise a hand. Quickly come. I want to pray for you. As you rise up, that's part of the process of shaking it off. As you rise up, the enemy, the past, all that's been holding you back, from that moment it begins, that's right, just come, hon. 
all over this room, every person, I want you to come. And we're going to pray for you this morning. Prayer teams, I want you to come as well. If you're here this morning, you have another need. In this last song of worship, you feel free to come and our prayer teams will pray with you as well. We're going to believe God for his divine intervention right now. Father, I thank you that we no longer have to allow the snake to dangle and pump its venom into us. Like the Apostle Paul, Lord, this morning we shake it off. Lord, we're so glad he shook it off into the fire so it could not come back and ever bother him again or anyone else on the island ever again. And Lord, we read in Revelation chapter 20 that there's a day you're going to shake the enemy off once and for all. And he too is going to go into the lake of fire never again to ever bring harm to another person. Lord, we're so glad. And I pray, oh God, Lord, this morning, all across this room, where men and women are saying, I'm shaking it off. Shaking off what has been said. Shaking off what has been done. Shaking off what has been meant for harm. Shaking off words that have literally shaped our lives. No more, no more, no more.